you get that started? Do you mm -hmm. want to sit and click? I don't have a clicker to progress it. Well, my husband and I are in the children's ministry, so if I get really animated with you and go, do you want to take a walk? Or do you want to take a walk? Then you'll know. I'm just kind of in that mood. I will try to step it down a little bit. Um, Joe Cassie was a very, very special place to me. Uh, my, my family roots are deep in that lake. Uh, my family's homestead out of Kula Lodge is still standing in the lake, uh, on its side nonetheless, but it's still there. So I love Joe Cassie. My mother passed on her love for it, and she got it from her mother, and the line came on down from the Whitmire women in the family. So um, I'd like to share some of my stories about Joe Cassie, and, and I'll let you take a peek at what's under there. If we have time, we're going to talk about how the lake was formed, and I've got photographs from Duke Archives and all that, so we'll just go till, I, till we can't go anymore. So. Yes, sir? A little louder, please. Okay, I can do loud. Okay. All right, this, ooh, let me get my laser pointer here. This is an aerial photograph that was taken around 1965. My Uncle Buck Williams was a pilot, and so he, he routinely would fly up to Joe Cassie instead of driving a car. So the big deal in my life when I was a kid was Uncle Buck picking us up in the airport in Columbia and flying us up here and landing in the um, cow pasture. And if we have time, I have a really interesting story about landing in that cow pasture. Um, our, our property started right here, and it ran up the mountain here and up the mountain here. And just in case you're wondering, you know, we did not end up with any lakefront property on Joe Cassie, which is very unfortunate. This is Attacula Lodge, which was my family's homestead. It was originally built as a, as a private home that my great-grandfather added on to it, and we started um, what they call a summer hotel. It's more than a bed and breakfast. It had, you know, you get three meals a day there. <clears throat> So we would land in the pasture right here, and that's our old barn. The beautiful Whitewater River is really what made Joe Cassie Valley so wonderful. I've seen, I've driven around and seen a lot of beautiful property in the mountains, but it's really hard to find one that has this beautiful river going through it. And that really was Joe Cassie's lifeblood. It was also the reason, one of the reasons that it, it became inundated, and we'll go into that a little bit later. Okay. Yes, that is, uh, that's the equivalent of 300 feet of water. Yeah, that's standing that looks just like that now. And uh, 300 feet, just to give you some perspective, is about the height of a 30-story building. So they could build a 30-story building in the middle of Lake Jocassee, and it would still be completely submerged. And this is what it looks like today. We were actually anchored to Atticula Lodge when this picture was taken and um, my husband is a photographer so he's given us a lot of really good photo uh, photographs but it's really beautiful this would be the um, whitewater arm of the lake you can see Bad Creek up here if any of you are familiar with Joe Cassie and then around up in here would be um, the Thompson River where it would flow into the water whitewater and then over here was Devil's Fork well, we called it a creek, but it had quite a water flow in it. This is a map of Lake Joe Cassie. So this is Devil's Fork State Park. This is where you would launch a boat now. It's the only place to get onto Joe Cassie. Um, is here and a couple of other little remote places here. Bad Creek's up here. I like to think, well, Joe Cassie shaped oddly enough, kind of like a J. But there are one, two, three, four major rivers that ran into the valley, which is why there's, there was so much water for them to build a, a hydro facility. Whitewater, Thompson, and then of course the horse pasture and the Toxaway River. Now if you look at, a, well we'll go over that in a minute. Here's a map of what used to be under the, under the lake with the lake superimposed on it. So where you would come down the road and you would have to make a sharp turn to the right at Devil's Fork State Park, we used to just keep going. And it would just wind on around the mountains and we would make a turn here and cross the river right at Camp Joe Cassie. And then, the, and then the, the road followed all the way to the end of the valley and then you had to turn around and go back the same way you came. 
If anybody has any questions where we're going along, please raise your hand and stop me. I'm very flexible. I may forget what I was saying, but we'll we'll get there. <clears throat> okay. So when you when you got into Joe Cassie, you crossed the steel, what I call the steel bridge. The girls that went to Camp Joe Cassie call it the Camp Bridge. Um, and the first thing you would see would be Camp Joe Cassie for girls right here. And these are little cottages that dotted the Whitewater River. They had cottages up on the hill. There was a little pond over here and a pavilion that was built. This original house, of course, my laser pointer is about shot. The original house was built by my great grandfather, W.M. Brown, as the home for his family. And they raised eight children there. Um, and actually the daughter of, of one of his sons is uh, in the audience with us today. Um, later on down the road, he had to move to Walhalla in order to educate the children. And he built the big house that's on Main Street that used to be Davenport Funeral Home. I don't know what it is now. Last time I looked, it was an antiques market or a flea market mm -hmm. or something. Um, and he ended up leasing the, uh, the property with the big house on it to a Reverend Wallace from Tennessee and Sarah Godbold, who was a PE teacher from Columbia. And um, they, they, went, they started Camp Joe Cassie there in 1922. Now, when I was doing my second book, I had to get dig deeper into Camp Joe Cassie. And uh, I found out that Originally, I wondered why they always called it Camp Joe Cassie for girls, because all I ever saw there were girls. Well, the first two years that the camp was in session, they actually had boys there as well. Um, I don't know how well that worked out, <laughs> but the third year, they decided to put the boys someplace else, and so it became Camp Joe Cassie for girls. And some people ask me, you know, they think it was a Girl Scout camp. It was not affiliated with the Girl Scouts. It was just a girls' summer camp. And then, of course, you had the beautiful Whitewater River. And about from here to here is about 1.2 miles. And this is where my family's home was. <coughs> and then down in here is a beautiful, beautiful area called Burgess Bottoms, which was absolutely stunning. You just came upon this little vista overlooking the river. And there's this beautiful pastoral setting. And we'll look at that in just a minute. And I'm going to grab my water for just a second. Was there a Camp uh, Joe Cassie for boys? Mm -mm. No. They did make a, they did build a boys camp somewhere in North Carolina. Oh. Well, they must have wanted them to get away from the girls. I can imagine. <laughs> but you know, there are a lot of stories, and Wayne, Wayne McCall's here with us. He knew Miss Sarah and Miss Ludie, That's and good. that ran the girls camp. Oh, and Julia, yeah. And in fact, Julia's mother, uh, owned the camp after after my grandmother's brother passed away. Um, she ended up running the camp from that point forward. She also cooked at the lodge. I've heard that, yeah. Um, Where did yeah, the name Joe Cassie come from? It, it is named for uh, Chief Atacula Kula was, a, was an actual Indian chief. He's very important in the history of the area. He's the one who went to England to uh, do the peace treaty with the British. Well, his supposed daughter is Joe Cassie. Now, I found out some years ago, and it was really very devastating to find out that Joe Cassie was not real. She was just just a myth, you know. But she was supposed to have been his um, his daughter. Joe Cassie means place place of a lost one. All right, this next slide we're going to look at, I'm really excited about. My husband worked for about three hours to get this for me because I said, I have to have this video clip in here. I just have to have it. And he said, I hate photo editing and DVD editing. And I said, no, but please try to get it. And he did. The University of South Carolina has a moving image research collection. And what they do is they collect home movies from anybody who wants to donate them. And the reason is because that's a culture and a lifestyle. There, there are historical landmarks and whatever that end up being in these movies that, you know, we, you know, may not even be there anymore. So they, they collect all these. Well, one of the girls who attended Camp Joe Cassie, her father, um, took lots of movies of her and her sister 
up there, but this one clip I'm really excited about because for me, um, walking and getting to Joe Cassie meant that, that first glimpse of the river when we got up there. And I'm reading right side up, but no, I am not crazy. Okay? <laughs> my, my publisher bound the book upside down, so it looks like I'm reading it upside down. But I'm just going to read a really short clip out of my first book. It's called Heavenly Days. The Bible says that heaven's streets are paved with gold, but the nearest place I knew to heaven on earth had a dusty road which followed every bend in the river as it wound its way into an enchanted land. A pristine valley tucked peacefully away in Upper Oconee County, Joe Cassie's life was the Whitewater River, which told the tale of recent rains or drought, depending on its crystal clarity or muddy torrents. A narrow bridge with steel girders heralded the only entrance into the valley. Crossing the bridge on our first day back to Joe Cassie, Mama would always note the condition of the river. Boy, it's sure been raining. It'll take a couple of rip days for the river to clear up. Or river's low. Pop said we can tell when it's really raining in the mountains. The river swells up. When it pours rain, the green waters turn into red torrents. <coughs> if the river overflowed its banks by three or four feet, the road was submerged and the valley was stranded. Whatever the river's condition, it was always a joy to be back. I scarcely have a childhood memory that is in some way linked to Joe Cassie Valley. We lived in Columbia, but Joe Cassie was our retreat, our place of refreshment, a place where we could truly relax and spend time enjoying the river, the food, the scenery. Returning to the valley, rounding the curve just before the steel bridge, the first thing you saw was Camp Joe Cassie for girls. This marked the beginning of the valley and of my family's life there. Its anchor building was a stately two-story Victorian-like house <coughs> built in the late 1890s by my great-grandfather, William Macasia Brown, as a home for his young wife, Sarah Louise Glazner. From Rosman, North Carolina, he and Lou traveled over the mountains by horse-drawn wagon to start a new life in Joe Cassie Valley, a suitable beginning for a young couple who had raised a family of eight children. When I saw this movie clip, I couldn't believe it. <clears throat> the one thing that I regret so much about everything that happened with the, the valley being flooded and the dam being built and all that was that we didn't, we didn't take a video camera. We, we didn't think to go around and journal some of these things as they were happening. And, um, but her dad did. And I have like an hour DVD of scenes from Joe Cassie and the river and stuff that, that USC gave me a copy of. So I'm going to share this little clip with you here. <laughs> yeah, we had to bring a trunk to Camp Joe Cassie. We just got rid of the one of my son had. Really? A thousand years ago. I still have mine, and it's up in the attic, and it's still painted royal blue because that was my mother's favorite color. Do you know where that was, where they were leaving from? Columbia. They lived in Columbia. Do you know what year it was? Uh, she is a little bit older than I, so she was about 10. Um, let's see. Let me think. Uh, sometime late 50s, probably. Maybe early 60s. <laughs> I don't know how they're ever going to get good. Okay, here's the sign that I was talking about. This is the sign that uh, when you got to Joe Cassie, and this is you're getting ready to cross the, the river there. You remember that, Julia? Mm -hmm. And, and this then is the metal bridge. Yeah, steel bridge. And that is Camp Joe Cassie, and that, that is the, uh, the gates. There's more, there's a lot more video of the girls' camp and stuff. People asked me if I went to the girls' camp. It was a, it was a, you could go two months in a row. The sessions were one month long. And my mother thought it was a good idea to enroll me in Camp Joe Cassie. And um, I stayed a week instead of a month because I hated it. <laughs> and it wasn't Joe Cassie to me. And I was really shy and they short-sheeted me on my first night there. And I felt like I got KP duty the first week and I just, you know. Yeah. So I just made myself sick. And my mother stayed up there and she would drive down the road and she would look for me and she'd hawk the horn and wave at me. I mean, really, come on. <laughs> and tell me where she was going and I couldn't go. So anyway, she decided after a week of 
me meeting her at the fence looking terrible, you know, <laughs> that she would take me out. And the can director said, well, if you take her out, she's going to be ruined for life. My mother said, I'll risk it. <laughs> and she took me out. So I have connected with a lot of girls, though, that went to Camp Joe Cassie. They have a Facebook group. They were great in helping me with my second book because I have a whole chapter on Camp Joe Cassie. And they, they shared all of their stories with me. And, you know, they have wonderful, wonderful memories. I mean, when they get together, they still put their tiaras on because they're Joe Cassie princesses. And they sing all the songs. And, and somehow or another, they wanted me to arrange a, a, a reunion for them. <laughs> thinking, well, there you go again. I get to do something else for Camp Joe Cassie. <laughs> okay. That is the steel bridge. Of course, that's the white water that runs under it. And that, that was one of the pictures that was from the, um, one of the girls' camp brochures. They change the brochure about every year, didn't they, Julia? And um, I don't know what year this was. This was probably in the early 60s, late 50s. What is the earliest uh, journal or brochure you have? <clears throat> I have some photographs from, I think, the 1925 brochure. Oh, wow. That's, that's the year I had the journal. Yeah. Really? Yes. Are, you the, are you the one that's meeting with the, um, the reporter from the Upstate yes, Lake? with me. Oh, are you Brett? <laughs> are you Brett? Okay, well, hey, Brett. Yeah, he's going to talk to us about Cam Joe Cassie. Yes. Um, is that the bridge that I believe in the B-roll footage I watched years ago that the divers tied off to when they were trying to find your lodge using that as a reference point? Yeah, they have found the steel bridge. The bridge was left in place. Now, it was, it was standard procedure when prepping the valley for flooding. Was it anything that could be deemed a, a boating hazard or a floating hazard that might clog up the intakes or something, they had to get rid of it. So, I, I, I've learned that there, there's a lot, most of the houses and all were burned or bulldozed. Um, but the steel bridge, I mean, it's anchored down, I mean, it's in concrete pillars, it's not going anywhere, and it's 318 feet from the surface to touch the bridge, so it's not likely that anybody's going to be bothering it. So, yeah, they have, they have, um, they found it, they found it back around 2002, I believe. Um, yeah, Jackie Smith from um, Charlotte was the first dive team on it. Jackie was, was a very with, good friend of mine. Yeah, yeah, I was there with him when they found it the first time. Really? Mm -hmm. Are you Samantha? Yes. I recognize you from some pictures I've seen before. Um, yes, Jackie and Charles were, uh, are, are, well, Jackie's deceased now, but they're very, very good friends of ours. Exceptionally professional divers. The divers that do this deep stuff, they have to be very, very highly trained to go to 300 feet. Uh, let's see, this was the original house. It has a sign on it called the Wallace Building. It was named after, named after Reverend Wallace who um, founded the camp. <coughs> These stone pillars are still standing and the picket fence is still standing. Oh. It even has paint on it. If you'll switch to the next slide, I think I may have a picture of it. That, that's a close up of it. And then one more. Oops, that one. Oh. Sorry. That's all right. That's what it looks oh, like wow. now, underwater. So, of course, the sun is gone. We don't know what happened to the sun. Um, but, yeah, the divers have been down to the, to the bridge, and they're just starting to explore out. I mean, you know, they don't want to go out too far, not knowing if there's anything there, because every, for every minute they're down there, their de decompression time just increases exponentially. I've been on the boat with them when they dive the girls' camp, and um, actually Jackie Smith left his dive reel sitting right, either right there or right there, last time he was down there, and of course it stayed there, and the last time they dove the girls' camp, they brought that up and gave it to me. And they said, we know that you will take care of it. So he, he had that dive with him on his deepest underwater dives. He's dived the Andrea Doria, and he's been down to 450 feet. Wow. And, um, so yeah, it's one of my Joe Cassie treasures. This, I love this picture. This is Wayne McCall in the orange shirt there. That's his mama. Isn't that Keller here? 
and uh, somebody else's dog, I think his name was Shep. No, Butch um, the dog. Who? <laughs> Butch. Butch, okay. Um, this is looking from as if you were going to, if you were standing right here looking this way, you would be leaving the valley. You'd be crossing over the river to go out of the valley. Even though that sign, they had a sign here and they had one that you just saw coming into the valley. Now this was of particular interest to me. This is a gauging station that the U.S. Geological Survey put in place and they had several of them in, in the rivers and for years they were gauging the water flow through the valley to determine if it would, you know, be um, conducive to, to damming damming it up and um, flooding it. So that's the next thing the divers want to stay in uh, spine. I understand from some of our research, and Wayne probably knows better than I do in this regard, that, that it was still standing when the lake began to fill. Yeah, the only, uh, uh, that's the old gauging station you're, you're, where the picture's taking your back up to the tennis court. Right. No, the only dive that we did, we did some test dives for the U.S. Navy to 365, the deepest point in the lake. That really? was the DCI in Canada, a mm -hmm. friend of the dive unit, Panama City. Well, the divers want, next time they go down there, they now that they know what, what side of the river it's on and that sort of thing, they want to see if they can locate that. Okay? That's a uh, close-up of the house. Now this sign, somebody just sent this picture to me not long ago, and I'm very grateful that people send me stuff all the time about Joe Cassie, and I'm very careful to preserve all of this. But there's a, there's a little arrow on the end of the sign here that points Camp Joe Cassie's that way, and right here is the end of Atacula Lodge, which was going that way, and that was my family's home. And a lot of the, um, the families of the girls' camp, when they would come up, to, you know, for a special program or to drop their children off or to pick them up or whatever, they sometimes would stay at, down at the lodge because we could um, sleep about 30 people if we were full. Wow. So. This is a view of, I, I just think this is the most gorgeous place in Joe Cassie, the swimming hole, or the baptizing hole as some people call it. Um, there's this, this nice natural beachy area. The road is right up here. The girls' camp would have been uh, up up river and just up here. They were they were from like, from like from a city block, maybe a half a block from the the point at which you went down the little path to go to the the swimming hole. I hate it when the girls' camp <laughs> came down to the river. I was so young and I just kind of felt like Joe Cassie was ours and I didn't want anybody else there and I'd hear that dumb whistle blowing and all these girls would come tromping down the hill, you know, and I'd get out and sulk for 45 minutes or so while they, <laughs> while they sat and shaved their legs and washed their hair and all that kind of stuff. So they did and on, the, on the shoals. It was a perfect place. But it was very... from Sarah Doddle's house. Yeah, yes. Well, it's Dodd. Yeah, this, this is a bluff up over the river, and there was a little um, cinder block house that sat up here, and it, it was Miss Sarah Godbold who ran Camp Joe Cassie. That was her little place, and it, that's, that was taken from that bluff. Um, that was really deep water right there, well over your head, and it was very swift, and we would jump on an inner tube a mile up the river and just float down the river and that's where we'd end up. But you had to paddle quick because otherwise you keep going on down the road. But it was just absolutely beautiful. This is uh, probably right across the street from Wayne's house. Does that look that's about right? That's looking, that's at our, on the rapids from our house. That's looking at the those trees on the right or where the Hinkle's house was. Mm -hmm. That was a beautiful I mean, you know, I talk about a lot about the, the, my personal memories of the river in my first book, Whippoorwill Farewell. Just sitting in that river and, you know, the, the rocks had this, um, this moss on it that it wasn't slippery, it was like carpet. And, you know, I just, I remember everything about Joe Cassie, every smell, every sight, every feeling. It was just, it truly was a magical place and I'm so sorry that I can't share it with my children and my grandchildren. They'll never see how beautiful this place was, except in a PowerPoint, you know? Okay. That's another, just another scene up there, looking upriver. Okay, this is my family's homestead. 
at a cool lodge, and it's still standing in 300 feet of water. It did start to lift off its foundation when the water started flooding the valley, and it, it just lifted up, but there's an interior masonry chimney that, that pinned it to the ground. The chimney, it just got heavy, and it just fell over on its side, like knocking a tissue box over on its side. Divers have been down to it a couple dozen times, and it brought me back artifacts from it. And um, we tie up to the lodge as a permanent line that's tied to the lodge to a, a buoy that um, is well below the water. We don't want the dive site known to people because there's going to be some scuba diver who th thinks he's going to do what they call a bounce dive and just drop down 300 feet, touch it, and come back up and explode when he gets to the surface. So. And you know, and the divers that dive on it are just so, um, so caring and wonderful. They know this is my family's house. It means a lot to me, and so they're very careful when they're there. Okay. Now this is what it looked in my day, because um, my grandmother, who maintained it so nicely, she died in 1951 on the way up to Joe Cassie to open it for the summer. She was killed in a car accident on the way up here. And uh, so my grandfather ended up moving here year-round, and he, he and my uncles were very mechanically minded, and his name was Pop, and if, he, would never, he would never buy a pack of screws. If he found a real deal on a 55-gallon drum of screws, he would buy a 55-gallon <laughs> drum of screws. And so it ended up being really junky, and Wayne knows because he was he had seen it, you know. But Pop had these 55 gallon drums sitting on the side of the porch. The, I mean, the porch ended up caving in there. <laughs> That's Pop's old black pickup truck, and this <laughs> my brother and my cousin built. It's a raft that floats on the bottom of, of real black inner tubes. They called it the Con Leaky, and. Um, <laughs> We, I, Jimmy actually let me float down the river with him on that, so that was a nice memory. Okay. This is when it looked better. That's my mother when she was about 15 years old, and the main house is facing that way. And this is the big dining hall and uh, sleeping quarters up here, big dining hall here, and additional sneak sleeping quarters up here. And I think they could even sleep up in the attic if. And people did. We had some little cottages that dotted around, and Mother said that when they got really full, um, people would actually sleep underneath the porch. You know, they didn't care. They just wanted to be up at Joe Cassie. Yeah. <clears throat> I personally not would, have, would not have slept under a porch at Joe Cassie because we had some mighty big snakes up there. But <laughs> <clears throat> now these, somebody told me about 10 years ago, that she climbed up on the roof as the lodge was as the lake was filling, and she said, "I got a bunch of shingles, and my husband made a planter for me for my den." And I'm thinking, I don't know what house she was on, but the lodge had a tin roof. Well, I found out from you know putting pieces together, the original lodge actually was covered with cedar-shaped shingles, and <clears throat> when I was a child, tin was overlaid on top of the roof. Well, as was practiced when the valley was being prepared for flooding, people, people would go in and take building materials off and whatnot to recycle them. <clears throat> the lodge was empty for a couple of years. And uh, they, they, they took the tin off the roof to, to reuse it. And now the divers are found in, found in the bottom just riddled with these cedar-shaped shingles. And I, I brought one of them with me over there on the table. They brought me six or seven of them. You know, they say if you want a if you want a souvenir from your dive, don't take a board off of Debbie's house because she will get you if you do that. <laughs> but you can have a cedar shaped shingle if you want one. Now that's mother again, but but she was standing in the front yard facing the lodge, and that's how close the river was. To us. It was about 30 yards from our front porch. Every night at supper time, that's what we would do. We would go out on the porch after dinner and we would just rock with no lights on and just listen to the river. It was, it was amazing. It was just amazing. Okay. Oh, back one more thing. Sorry. Go 
the fourth one. Okay, right here. That is a swinging bridge that um, my uncles built. And you will see in the next slide what my mothers insisted they do to the swinging bridge. I had a cousin who was a little bit younger than me, and she would get out in the middle of the swinging bridge and she would jump on it and it would make that bridge do this. And our mothers were scared to death that we were going to fall into the river, so they made my uncles put chicken wire up on the, on the side oh, of the bridges, <laughs> on the cable all the way down to the bridge, so we wouldn't fall in. That's looking down river. And that was the car bridge. We had a two-story log cabin right over here across the river that my grandfather built for my grandmother. And my uncles built this car bridge. They were very engineering-minded, smart men. And they, they, it, was, it was on logs, and they anchored it to you know, big steel cables anchored to trees on the river bank. You know. <clears throat> um, it, it did really great, unless the river flooded and we got a bunch of debris coming from up river and I remember I've got some pictures <coughs> in my book of the river where it's just really been stuff has gotten up under it and knocked the knocked the fool out of it. But yeah, one of the biggest snakes I ever saw in my life was on that river and I jumped right over it and didn't see it <coughs> until my cousin behind me screamed. Alright, this is what I was saying was the was Burgess Bottoms. The river ran pretty straight, but right here it made a, a curve to the right and then and then another like a like a gentle um well i don't know what you call it like an h without a leg on it that was an old um rental cabin i believe that's what i understand there there was a beautiful white house back here you can hardly see it it was owned by the alexander family but this was just a just a beautiful pastoral area my brother has commented before, although he hated to see Joe Cassie get flooded it's so much that he won't come up here. He's never come up to see the lake. He will not come up here. Um, but he's commented that maybe it was better that Joe Cassie had a quick death rather than watching it change by being developed because it was such a beautiful area and there was so little development up there that surely this would have been a golf course or some sort of thing. And Walmart. Then, oh, <laughs> yeah, God forbid there'd be a Walmart in the middle of Joe Cassie. But it would, have, it would have been, I'm sure that as, as some of the older Joe Cassie folks died off and maybe their children, either one couldn't afford to keep the land or they just didn't have the love for it that their parents did, it would have gotten sold. And I think it would have broken our hearts to see condominiums on the mountainside and that kind of thing. So at least it's covered up just the way it was. You know, we still have it in our minds, our memories. Okay. <coughs> That's one of the black inner tubes that we would float down. That's a friend and girlfriend of mine that would come down pretty regularly. And we were actually sitting on, this was right across from, right near your mother's house, Wayne. starting to get right into the swimming hole, okay? Okay, now this picture, I, you know, I just, you don't realize the impact that something's going to have on you until many, many years later. But I remember sitting in the river, that's me, my, grand, my granddaughter was mortified when she saw this picture on the wall of the upstate country, upstate history museum in Grable. She looked at it and I said, you know who that is? She said, no. <laughs> said, that's me. And she's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, and if I had known it was going to end up being all over the internet, I might have thought differently about it too. But anyway, we were sitting on that big shawl that was right at the swimming hole, having a picnic, and if General click, click, click the next one, that's what was going on at that very moment. Oh, so they, they were blasting the mountain to, to build the dam. And I remember being up there and hearing the dynamite blast. Mm -hmm. But you know, when you're 15, mm -hmm. 16 years old, I was more, I'm, <clears throat> truthfully, I will confess it to you now, Wayne, I was trying to get your attention in the river and you never <laughs> paid any attention. <laughs> <laughs> you evil man. <laughs> we would just.
must be down there and saunter and trying to get his attention. He didn't. He didn't. <laughs> <laughs> And that's what that area looks like today. If you go out onto Lake Jocassi, and if you're in a boat and you're looking at the dam, which you can't really see the dam, you can just see the straight long horizon, the area to just to the, the left of the dam from the Jocassi side is an area that, that we call the quarry. And that's, that's one of the main places that they got rock fill and earth to build the dam. That's a very popular dive site. There's a lot, there's a Chinese junk, a teak junk sailboat sunk at about 60 feet, which is pretty cool to, to dive down to. And um, yeah, divers put up all kinds of stuff down there just to have something to look at. It's not, there's not much to look at in Joe Cassie. It's beautiful, clear water, but especially in that area, it, there's no trees or anything. So. Okay, this is one of the photographs I got from Duke Energy Archives. Um, this represents where the dam is. Now they had to clear off anything that the dam was going to touch had to be cleared off to bare rock. Um, this is the old Chapman Bridge that went across the Kiwi River. The white water came down and merged with the Toxaway right, right up in there. The river curved around this mountain and it formed the Kiwi River, and um, so the Kiwi River ran underneath the dam site. Now this, this um, Chapman Bridge, which Jerry may touch on in his talk, was actually dismantled prior to inundation, and they were very careful to number all the pieces to make sure that they got everything back exactly where it was. It was reconstructed on a small cove on Lake Kiwi, and some kids started a bonfire on it, and burn it down. So, yes, the Debbie. Huh? The Kiwi River started on the upside of the dam where the, the girls camp, and the Toxaway and the white water came together right. at the point down below the old haunted house. That's where the Kiwi right. River started right. on the up yeah. upstream side of the dam. Yeah, the river went around this mount, mountain here. You can't see it in the picture, but I'm, I'm estimating the Kiwi started right around there. Anyway, it was it was above the dam that the Kiwi River started. Yeah, the bottom below the horse farm. Yeah, and this all is now Lake Kiwi under Lake Kiwi. So this picture that I showed you earlier, this aerial view over at Joe Cassie Valley, is right there. If you if you study it carefully, particularly if you look in my book and study it carefully, you can see the you know you can see the lodge that's sitting right there and everything. And this is Burgess Bottoms, that pretty pastoral area I was showing you. Just give you an idea how how things were there. Okay. That's uh, an old picture of um, Chapman Bridge going across the Kiwi River, and that's where they put it. It was just a little shallow cove that they were putting it on in Lake Kiwi, but unfortunately, it's not there anymore. This is uh, one of this this area is called the Barrow area. This is where Duke Energy got um, some of their rock fill. They had to. You know, they had the dam as, a, as an earthen dam, so uh, they had to, to, to borrow soil and rock from other places to build the dam. They also had to clear cut around the entire shoreline to the 11, to the 1,000 foot ele elevation. Jocassi, when it's full pond, is 1,100 feet in elevation. So they had to clear it down to a thousand foot elevation, um, and in some cases that would only be a hundred feet of shoreline. But if it was a really sloping area, it might be a whole bunch of shoreline that ended up getting inundated. And if you ever go on Jocassi when the the lake, lake level is down, you'll see, you know, part of the mountain ridges and stuff. Okay, Debbie, it's one thousand one hundred and ten feet full pond. Okay. This is the old Fred Williams Bridge that crossed the Kiwi River. Now, you'll notice that the Kiwi River is dry here. They had to, obviously they had to have a dry dam site or construction site when they were building the dam, so they had to divert the river. And we're gonna show you what that looked like in just a minute. You'll see where they're, there's a, they're tunneling out here. They started a 
tunneling through this mountain so that the river, and they diverted it and it ran through the mountain and came out below the dam site. And that's, that's what the diversion tunnel looked like as they were building it. <clears throat> These things are called penstocks, and I could talk for an hour about how the dam is constructed and how it functions because I, I had to learn it for my second book, and I was um, grateful that Duke actually let me have access to their archive photos. The only thing that they didn't want me to mention in my book was land values. Mm -hmm. And I said, nope, not that kind of book. So um, I, I learned a lot about how the, the dam was built and how it functions, and it really is fascinating, and people were great to help me. That is just showing the dam in process. It, <coughs> it had all different kinds of layers of rock fill. Uh, these little things you see every now and then are called drainage windows. The dam is actually designed for water to pass through it. So people have said, oh, there's a leak up there at the top that's supposed to be like that. It's not going to, you know, deteriorate the dam or anything. That is one of the um, intake tunnels. There are two of them on Joe Cassie. Each intake tunnel services two generators. So when they they release water in Joe Cassie, and this is really was very interesting to me because I want to know how things work. Underwater there are these these tall 24 foot grates that there are eight of them that go around the base of the tunnel. And when they they have a cable system that they literally pull the stopper up, it's like taking a stopper out of a bathtub and the water rushes into the power tunnel, which is about 30 feet in diameter, and then it goes down to um, the penstocks, and they're about 18 feet in diameter, and this penstock goes to that turbine, and the water hitting the turbine spins it around real fast, and then it spits it back out into Kiwi. So you multiply that times four, so that's, that's how they generate electricity um, at Joe Cassie. Did you so ever you're, dive? Did huh? You ever, did you ever dive those? I have not dived these, no. I don't think it's a safe thing to do. Um, I, I, kn I know there are divers that do. We dove them, and a good description is a concrete patio with a giant lion's cage on it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, um, it like. Duke told me that they don't just generate electricity by pushing a button at Joe Cassie. They can do it through computer technology from Charlotte or wherever. And so people that think that they know the schedule when they're going to be releasing water, um, I wouldn't bet on it because it's subject to change. So uh, it, it would, if, you were ha if you happened to be diving right there when they started to release water, you'd get sucked up against that grate. Now, would it kill you? Maybe not, but it would hurt you, and you would still sure struggle to get loose of it. So if you won't dive there no more. We got security barriers all around. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. But once a diver gets underwater, and I won't say any more about that. So. <laughs> okay. This picture was taken on April 8, 1971. To me, this was when Joe Cassie died. April 8, 1971. This is when they actually closed up that diversion tunnel we were talking about, and it started forcing the water to back up over Joe Cassie. They've actually not, there's, there's a, of course there's a huge concrete wall here that they put in place, but inside that diversion tunnel they actually um, built these big uh, forms out of wood and pumped it full of concrete so there are stop points for water at a couple of different locations in those diversion tunnels. And this was taken probably sometime in, in 1970. I can't read the date on it. But you see, here's... I, I really am a blonde. I help it out a little bit, but I am blonde. I was looking at my laser pointer at home and I'm going, this doesn't work anymore. And then I realized I was pointing to the wrong end and I just did it. I just did it then. So, um, this is the dam and these are the two intake structures. 
So this mountain is actually, I mean, you would think that the lake at this point would be very, very deep, but that mountain is only about 25 feet deep, you know, to the, to the mountain top now if the, if the lake is full pond. And that, that was taken in 1971, but it might as well have been taken yesterday, because that's what it looks like. The dam is, is 1,750 feet long, which is the equivalent of about six football fields placed end to end. It's 385 feet high, and if you could take a slice of it and look at it from the side, it's narrower at the top, and then, of course, the base broadens because there's more water pressure the deeper you go. And if you look at it from the bottom of the base to the bottom of the base here, it's about as wide as four city blocks. So it's quite, quite a structure. This is taken fairly recently. I know they had, this is from Jumping Off Rock. Have anybody, has anybody been out there? Um, I remember my only hike that I took with the girls from Camp Jocassi was to Jumping Off Rock. Of course, there was no lake there, and so, you know, I looked at it and went, oh yeah, okay, that's great, you know. <laughs> we had to walk all this way for that. Um, but that's, that's pretty much what it looks like today. I know the Department of Natural Resources has cleared out a really beautiful overlook for, for viewing. Did you know that Jocassi, I'm sure you probably do because you live up here, but Jocassi Gorges area, Lake Jocassi and the surrounding area was, was uh, uh, National Geographic magazine called it one of the top 50 places on the earth that you need to see before you die. I'm afraid that the secret about Jocassi is out. It used to be I could, you know, talk about Jocassi, and unless I was up here, nobody knew what I was talking about. Um, Court, the yeah, that's me. Uh, I was inspired to learn to dive, although I'm still trying to figure out why. And just to clarify, just to correct what's on the internet, I do not dive to 300 feet. I have not dived to my house. People say why not, and I said I'm blonde, I'm not stupid, and I've seen it. You know. So I'm not going 300 feet deep. Um, and I did not dive down and bring myself a light fixture back. That's another thing that's been propagated on the internet. But there's, you know, there's all kinds of, of sport facilities and stuff to do at Jocassi. Now this is Charles, one of the deep divers who actually did go down to the house the very first time. He's the one who brought me back the side light that was sticking out well, we thought it was the window, but now we know it's the door jam because the house is on its side. So he, they brought it back to me, and I'll show you a picture of it. This is this used to stand by the front door. We still have them today. I have them on either side of my door in my house. You know, it's that wooden frame that has glass in it beside your front door. <clears throat> this story of finding Attacula Lodge intact in the lake and everything got the attention of CNN some years ago and they they did a, a great video of it and it's on my website if you want to pick up one of my cards before you leave um, it's it's interesting they did a 13 minute piece on Joe Cassie and finding the house in the lake CNN yes I know. <laughs> they must be. You think they I'd must be you... raising their intellectual limits. <laughs> <laughs> this, this was a little show called News to Me, and they actually were on HLN, which was CNN's sister station. <coughs> but our video, I say our video, was on CNN one day, and it was it stayed number one on CNN all day long until Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie bumped us off. We beat out President Obama's State of the Union address. I thought something was kind of odd when I'm sitting at my desk and I'm starting to get emails from people in Russia and Montana and talking about how your story made me cry and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, that is really random. My website got 12,000 hits that day. So, wow. Quite a story. This is something that somebody somebody else sent me that with that on it. He said, I am getting so tired of telling my children just how beautiful some places used to be. Mm -hmm. And that's true. Mm -hmm. Lake Jocassi is beautiful, and I'm a big promoter of keeping it pristine and undeveloped. And I believe that it will stay undeveloped, um, at least probably through my lifetime. Um, <clears throat> but I'm telling you, if you could peel back those waters, 
and see what I see when I go up there is just amazing. So I have about 10 more minutes on my clock before Jerry comes up. If anybody has any questions, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Did you have a question? Go ahead. Um, um, what? How many? I just forgot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I do that all the time. That's okay. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, sir. What did people do for a living? I mean, what day, your parents had a great house up there, and you know, how did they, uh, they farm, or how did they farm? Well, my, my great-grandfather actually owned a big, uh, started a, a machinery company, farm farm tractors, farm equipment company up here in Walhalla. Um, okay, so this was just a kind of a summer home that they would go to. Well, originally, originally the girls' camp house they built as their permanent residence. Then they moved to Walhalla. But he married a Whitmire girl whose family were among the first um, settlers in the valley, white settlers in the valley. And so the Whitmires were farmers, had small farms. And that, that's pretty much, I mean, if you had a place in Joe Cassie, you either had a small farm or you ran a bed and breakfast <clears throat> in the summer or, um, well, see, I forgot what the third one was. See? Yes, sir. Um, what did you have to do to prepare for the water to um, flood? Well, I tell you what, I remember the last time I went up there with my Uncle Fred, he, he called me, I was in college by that time, I think. They were backing the water up already, but we could still get in. And I went up with him, and we just walked through the house, you know, it's, you know, I tell people it was kind of like getting ready for somebody to die, except I didn't, I didn't have the hope of seeing them again. You know, it was, it was very sad. It was real hard those later years, even when we still had access to the houses, because the lumber trucks, the big lumber trucks were coming in and out of the valley, and that, that's all you heard, was just them going up and down the road and cutting timber. Uh, there was so much timber there. In fact, they, they, they did not have time to get it all out. I mean, they're, they're, the divers tell me there are trees down there this big round, you know, that they just didn't have time to get it done. Did that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I yes, learned sir. to swim mm -hmm. up there. Did you really? My brother in, in the girls' camp lake. Yeah. The one with leeches? Yeah. <laughs> and my brother said, you want to learn to swim? I said, not in there. And he gave me a shove, and I learned to swim. Yeah, I bet you did. <laughs> I sure did. The, uh, the girls in the girls' camp um, told me that, you know, they just they, they had to get in there because that's where all the swim lessons and all were. Yeah. But they got out as quick as they could and pulled the leeches off of each other. Oh. Oh. Just, the river didn't have leeches, but for some reason that pond did. Um, in, the, in the movie Deliverance, you know, I've been, where they're digging up the caskets, they're moving them. Was that in Joe Cassie? Yeah. Do you know where that was? Yeah, that's Mount Carmel Cemetery. Um, if you can find that slide of the underwater, of the map superimposed on the lake, it's way back towards the beginning. That's Mount Carmel Church. They're moving in the movie, isn't it? No, actually that was a movie prop. Um, the actual <laughs> church had been, um, somebody bought it for like $500 and, and they dismantled it to use the lumber elsewhere. I mean, they, they, you know, they were thrifty people. They didn't just throw something away. That was a movie prop. And, um, but, but the scene where they were moving the graves and exhuming the graves, that, that was an actual activity that, that Duke Energy was overseeing right then. Okay, Mount Carmel Church is right there. So, Here's where you enter at the main boat ramp at Devil's Fork. So it's it's right out in here. It's, pre, it's kind of right off of this point here. You went out straight. Um, there are, I mean, that is a dive site. It's 138 feet, I think, deep at Full Pond. And, um, you know, the divers, I haven't been down to there, but the divers, you know, say that there are some graves that were untouched and then there were others that there's a big hole in the ground. Uh, some people, the families had had a choice as to whether or not they wanted to have their, you know, loved one moved and relocated 
or whether they wanted it left like it was. So there's some of both there. So there's still the tombstones for some of them? Down there, there are some, still some. There's, there's grave curbing. There are, there are, the only tomb, actual tombstone I have seen is um, Silas Hinkle's tombstone, and it's one of those big ones. Uh, but there are some uh, memorial markers, you know, name markers down. And there's a, there's a little girl named Doris Hamilton. She died when she was two, I think. And um, the divers on her birthday, they go down and uh, wipe the silt away, and they put flowers and teddy bears on her grave and stuff. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah. yeah, interesting. Yeah. How were the landholders approached for the acquisition of the properties and were any of them forced off the land and, or whatever? Well, you certainly would have been forced off the land. It would have been, um, it would have been mandatory. I mean, they just, they would have had the right, I forget what you call it. Eminent domain. Eminent domain. domain. Yeah. yeah, you had no choice. Um, my family owned 176 acres in the valley, so we were the, the largest single landowner in the valley. There were other people that had more land, but some of theirs was up, not going to be inundated. So they, it's my understanding they approached us first, and it was like, we're going to build a dam, flood the valley, we have to make arrangements to buy your property. And I remember the day that man came and talked to my Uncle Buck and Mama about that. Remember it very clearly. Yes, sir. Um, did any, did everybody, uh, were there any, like, truck, timber trucks? Did they see the water getting flooded out? Did any of the trucks see what, like, the... Well, I think they pretty much got every, all the, all the cars and the trucks got out of the valley before they started flooding it. And the reason I know that is because that steel bridge that we looked at earlier, um, Duke put a bunch of debris on the, on the bridge, you know, rock and um, tree trunks and that sort of thing to block it, to keep cars from coming in because they were getting ready to back it up. Um, and, and divers have confirmed that, it's, you know, that is the case. So when you have an eyewitness, so, but no, I don't think any trucks got caught. Now, I do have a picture in my new book of one of the trucks that was working on the Joe Cassie Dam and he got a little too close to something and he tipped over and went into the water, so. Yes, sir. Did Duke talk to you about the earthquakes that happened after the lake was filled? Uh, no, sir, I'm aware that they have had some and they, and from, from what I understand, they say that any time you have a large body of water being filled, that just the sheer pressure and weight of that massive amount of water does cause some minor quakes, but yeah, the Brevard Fault runs right under Jocassi, uh, very close to the dam. And I, I asked them about that. I mean, I have, I have a, uh, he's now a very good friend. He's also a diver, but it turns out he's the project manager over the Jocassi project. His name is Alan Boggs. And he was kind of my go-to person when I was writing this second book because I didn't know what a turbine was, you know. <laughs> And he, he would answer questions for me. And I asked him about, you know, what about earthquakes? I mean, what if we have an earthquake? And he said, Debbie, it, in the Appalachian Mountains, we don't have the, um, the strong earthquakes that, like they do in the West Coast. Otherwise, these mountains wouldn't be here. And he said it would, it would take, I think he said like an 8.5 earthquake to really damage the dam and do some severe damage to it. But he said somebody could fly a 747 into the dam. It's not going to fail just like that, like it's gone all of a sudden. It would damage it certainly very badly, but the, the fear that people have had about the dam breaking and all, you know, all of Joe Cassie rushing and flooding the nuclear station and everything, that, you know, that's probably not likely to happen because it would have to be there one second and not there the next. Um, but, who knows? I hope it doesn't happen. Uh-huh. Uh, as far as you, you might know, um, are any of the buildings down there, were they made out of chestnut trees, you know, like chestnut wood? I don't know specifically. I, um, I know we had a lot of old hardwood down there. Hemlocks were very popular. Um, we had a coffee table on our front porch that was cut from a single tree slab, it was about that thick, you know, 
and it was about that big around. So, but in, in so far as the specifics, I don't know. I don't know what the lodge is made out of. That would be an interesting thing to analyze. They, you know, if we could bring up a board, I don't know if they'd have any way of being able to tell what it is or not. They can. They can. Well, it would be interesting That's how to find out. I know the floors. Are, the floors were white pine. But that, that, that's all I really know about it. Well, it's about time for us to take a short break and let Mr. Vickery come up and talk with you. I've brought all my scrapbooks and this sort of thing. If anybody like, would like to look, please um, help yourself. Your books are for sale? Yes. Mm -hmm.